Oki, Nagana Go Meko Che Che Stokom Oki. Welcome to Chapters and Chat Book Club. Uh, today we are going to be discussing with the author Bruce McIver Standoff Why Reconciliation Fails Indigenous People and How to Fix It. So I'm so happy that you're all here. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, in just for everyone to know, uh, this particular, well, I guess this book club is being um, held on Treaty 7 territory. This is the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the uh, Siksika, Bagani, and Gainai, and then south of the border are the Blackfeet Nation, and Treaty 7 was signed with partners of uh, the Stony Nakoda, Wesley Chiniki Bearspaw Nation, and the Dene from Sutina, and I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. Uh, my name is Michelle Robinson. I'm the host and founder of Chapters in Chat, and uh, really honored to be here. I'm Satu Dene. I was born here in Calgary, and we have a podcast called Native Calgarian that will go, this is being recorded to go onto the podcast as well as a YouTube channel for folks who uh, unfortunately missed tonight because we have Bruce. So uh, for folks who don't know how we do um, safe accountable spaces in this particular book club, so we actually allow Indigenous people to speak first. And we do that because uh, non-Indigenous have always had the uh, narrative, have incorrectly given misinformation about Indigenous people, and we want to break those cycles by having Indigenous-led conversations and allowing settlers or colonizers, whatever you decide you are, be able to listen and engage after Indigenous have spoke. So I'm just going to throw that out there to everybody. Uh, you are being recorded. So if you prefer not to be recorded, please do not hesitate to private message me. And um, we will uh, pause the recording for any time that you speak so that you can speak freely in an effort to create safer space. Uh, I use she and her pronouns. I encourage everyone to let us know what pronouns you use so that that way we don't misgender you and try to create a safer, more inclusive space for those of that may identify as trans or non-binary and I think those are kind of my safety rules without looking uh and I just want to welcome Bruce McIver here thank you Bruce for coming and being here I'll let you have the floor here for a minute okay thanks well I just want to say thank you for the invitation and thanks everyone for showing up on a Tuesday on I don't know what day of the week this is now but uh I'm sure you all might have some shopping left to do perhaps for the holidays too. And there's a lot go going on. So I just want to say thank you very much for your, in for your interest. Um, looking forward to a good conversation. Yeah, no kidding. Bruce, where are you from? And I'm pretty sure you identify as Métis in the book. So I just wanted to yeah. give you the floor for that intro too. Okay. Yeah. My, um, my family is part of the Red River Métis. They're originally from St. Peter's. If there's some of you that know Manitoba, uh, St. Peter's was the main Métis settlement on the Red River just north of Selkirk. Um, so my uh, grandparents and quite a few of my family members were some of those Métis, child, uh, Métis children from the Manitoba Act who didn't get their land at Red River. And I always tell people in a roundabout way, that's how I ended up becoming a lawyer because we moved along with the Peguis First Nation about a, um, um, 200 kilometers north uh, up into where there's a lot of rocks and swamps. And we farmed up there when I was a kid. Uh, I picked a lot of rocks when I was a kid and um, had to find something else to do. <laughs> so that's how there are days when I, when as a lawyer, I think uh, maybe I'd be better off pick, picking rocks. But um, yeah, so that's how I ended up here. 
Wow. Well, I, I really enjoyed reading some of the cases that you've had to take as a lawyer in your book. Yeah. So I, I'm really honored you would just give us time, give us your time oh, yeah. at all. I know lawyers yeah. like charge by the 15 minutes. So I just <laughs> like seriously appreciate you being here. No, um, right. So I know uh, Kathy identifies as Indigenous. Would you like to start uh, talking about the, the book from your point of view and, uh, you know, any questions you might have for Bruce? Hi, my name's Kathy Bear. I'm from Muscaday Cree First Nation. Oh, yeah. um, I don't have a lot to say because um, it must have been meant for me to not have read the book by now. I bought it <laughs> months ago, hard copy, and it went MIA. I started looking for it last Tuesday. Somehow it disappeared from my home. I haven't lent it out. So, and then. <laughs> I or I went and put a hold at the Calgary Public Library for a book. It finally came through today, the hold. So, um, but meanwhile, I went and bought a book on Thursday. I bought a soft copy book. And, um, but I ended up going to Edmonton for a birthday party, a 65th birthday party. So I never got a chance to read it. No worries. So I am just going to sit here and listen. Um, the, the, 40 some pages I've read so far are very good. And I wish I <laughs> could have had a chance to read the whole book. My apologies. Um, and I look forward to hearing the discussion tonight. Thank okay. you. Awesome, Great. thanks Kathy. Uh, anyone else who identifies as indigenous before we just kind of start up the participants list and move down? Okay, so I guess we'll start with Carol, then Kat, Rosemary, Jen, uh, Nathan, Rebecca, Shelley, and then Siri. And Wendy. You're at the very bottom there. Okay, Carol. Hi, Michelle. Thanks. And I loved this book. I like the way it was written. I learned my job here is to learn and to disseminate to people what I've learned. And I learned a lot from this book. And um, I like the way it was written. Um, the, the hardest part, one of the hardest, there was a lot of, was when um, Mr. McIver puts his hands in his face at the table around with his children. And I thought, this is, yeah. this is despair, but he's done such great work. But I was really curious about what his thoughts would be about Premier Daniel Smith and how her Sovereignty Act will affect Indigenous people in Alberta. and. Um, I mean, everybody smirks at her idiocy, but it's really the First Nations leaders who are really standing up to denounce her act. And mm -hmm. I mean, they signed treaties with the British Crown about the province of Alberta. And, and I, I mean, I learned a lot about that as well. So I'm just gonna ask, so my thinking is that the First Nations that signed treaty six, seven, and eight are actually sovereign nations, if I'm correct. And isn't that why they were able to sign these nation to nation treaties with the British crown in the first place? So these treaties are the fundament of both Alberta's and Canada's existence. So if she wants to undo all of this and start from scratch, well, I think she's gonna open a torrent and, and just find that First Nations people are, are much tougher with her than she's anticipating. So. Um, I just was curious about his, your thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for taking the time. And, uh, yeah, I find it a bit ironic, the Sovereignty Act, because I think for those of you that have had a chance to read some of my book, there's a, there's a real question hanging over the basis of Canadian sovereignty to begin with. So... <laughs> <laughs> where um, where the idea can come from that um, you know that's without question, and then just within the f federal system, um, provincial sovereignty. There is no provincial sovereignty, of course. So, uh, but in comparison to indigenous people, uh, it is just another slap in the face that, unfortunately, you get too often from the current Alberta provincial government. I do a fair amount of work in Alberta and um, 
I work all across the country and probably in regards to respect for indigenous rights, I think Alberta is pretty well right down at the bottom of the list. They're do, do, they're duking it out with Sask. Susk with Saskatchewan right now who can disrespect Indigenous rights more. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't think it's going to go very far. I think it's more of a dog whistle kind of piece of legislation leading up to the next provincial election. And constitutionally, um, it's hard to see that it standing up to a court challenge, all depending on what action the provincial government would take based on the so-called Sovereignty Act. Um, but it's one of the big outstanding issues in the law. Um, where did the Canadian state get sovereignty from to begin with? So if it leads to a conversation about that, then maybe something positive can come out of it. Th thank you, Carol. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kat. I'm a settler who was also born in Manitoba in oh. Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. Um, I also really loved your book and uh, similar to similar reasons uh, to what Carol said, your um, the way you presented the law in a very straightforward, plain language, I really appreciate it. I love the why it matters section of each um, chapter as well. Um, a question that's sort of related to the book, but um, something I've always wondered about is about treaties. Um, in your opinion, do you think it would be better for Indigenous people to um, work with the existing treaties and sort of um, Indigenous people and their allies sort of force the government to honor those treaties or would it be better to renegotiate them completely? Oh, Which that's a good good question. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, some of the compliments I get about the book that I appreciate the most are when people say I really enjoyed it. You didn't sound like a lawyer. <laughs> I'm like, hey, excellent. <laughs> Hopefully, I sound like a lawyer more in court, but uh, that that was definitely not the intention with the book. Um, as far as the treaties go, as I was just saying, I think the number one outstanding question in Aboriginal law in Canada is respect for the treaties and implementing the so-called historical tr tr treaties. Um, of course, it's not for me to decide what First Nations would do around that, but based on the work that I do, I can't see very many Indigenous people supporting a, a position that would be abandoning those treaties and seeking to negotiate something else for lots of reasons. One, because as probably a lot of you know, they're deemed to be sac sacred uh, agreements between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And they were negotiated at a time and uh, that represented a different relationship and one that I think most Indigenous people want to make everyone else in Canada aware of and reinvigorate that relationship. Um, so most of what I see is in at least my clients wanting to implement the true meaning of the treaties, not to abandon them. But one of the main outstanding issues is that governments, colonizing governments, take this narrow self-serving approach that they were seed release and surrender treaties. And no one that I know agrees with that. That's, I think, the fundamental problem here is that provincial governments think they own all the land and get to make all the decisions about the land. And that's not what the intention was at treaty. And getting back to that, um, I think, is some of the most important hard work that first treaty first 
nations particularly are, are doing. Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you. All right, Rosemary, I think you're up next. You are muted. Ask to unmute. Thank you. Um, so my name is Rosemary Brown. I use she and her pronouns. And I was born and raised on the ancestral lands of the Onondaga Nation in upstate New York. And I've lived here in Mokinstis for about 46 years now. Um, unless I get my ebooks and, and audiobooks through iBooks, I can't get them. Uh, or access them. So I've been reading several of the interviews that you've given around okay. the book. And uh, one, just to echo what everyone else has said, I just love plain language, <laughs> the clarity <laughs> you bring to the all of the terms from doctrine of discovery, terra nullis, et cetera, is so important. And I especially appreciate what you have to say about the duty to consent, because for those of us who have for example, been supporting the Wet'suwet'en and other groups. That, that's such a big issue. And I know I've been really confused about it. And I think mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to hear one, I'd like to hear you speak more to that today because I think it's so critical in our discussions with people. And uh, <clears throat> secondly, I, I'm not surprised that Alberta is at the bottom of the <laughs> list uh, in terms of uh, legal, um, battles and, and issues, because I keep thinking of what Cindy Blackstock has to say about Alberta when it comes to implementing Jordan's principle. It's just, mm -hmm. this is just mm -hmm. a really difficult place to be working in. And yeah, and I have another question, but I'll talk about that later. So if you could just expand on the whole issue of duty, duty to consult and, and the relationship of that to consent. Sure, thanks, thanks, Rose. Mary, uh, for those that prefer the audiobook format, it's coming out as an audiobook um, on the 15th. I was um, honored. Um, um, Lauren Card of Cardinal uh, did the reading of it. Uh, he just, it was one of those things I didn't expect as a lawyer to be sitting in on a on a studio production of reading the book and Lauren has such a beautiful voice and his warm generous heart really comes out I just can't say enough about him um yeah so that's coming out on the 15th I was out in Halifax last month the month before and speaking at a duty to consult conf conference there and one of the points that I made was I basically said, why did you people invite me to this? <laughs> Don't you know who I am or what I write? Don't you read anything about that, dude? Because I'm not a real fan of the duty to consult. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of that work. I've been involved in a lot of the cases for years and years and years. But this goes back to the point we were just talking about. The duty to consult is predicated on the doctrine of disc of disc of discovery. It's predicated on the idea that colonizing nations can just show up, time the land, and usurp indigenous decision making authority, and then all decision making authority resides in the crown, whether mm. it's provincial or federal. And then all that, um, in most cases, not all, but usually, they have to do is consult with Indigenous people about a decision that they're intending to make. Um, that, so the, the whole premise is wrong. Mm -hmm. To begin with, Indigenous people should be able to exercise their own decision making about the land, not simply be consulted with about someone else's decision. I was talking to some treaty clients a week or two ago talking about, do you think that's what the promise was at treaty? You know, you're there in treaty seven, I guess most of you, do you think that's what the promise was at Blackfoot crossing and 
1877. We promise to consult with you about decisions that we will make about your land. I don't think so. I don't think that's what the intention was. So uh, yeah, I do a lot of duty to consult. At, from a legal viewpoint, there are times when it can be helpful to create leverage for indigenous people to get a better outcome. But it's definitely not the be all and end all. I tell most of my clients, if you're still doing consultation, you're already lost. You know, <laughs> you got to get to a consent based world. So thanks, Rose, Mary. Thank you. All right. It looks like uh, Jen might be up, and I'll pause it just for a minute. Um, thank you. Um, I'm really late to the game, so I just got my copy from the public library today <laughs> um, and actually just signed up for this session last week. So um, just here to learn, really just here to learn. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Thanks. Jen. And um, I guess Car Carol went, Kat went, Jen, Kathy Bear went. Nathan, would you like to... Um, uh, take yourself off of mute. And would you like to be recorded? I can pause it if you prefer at any point. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm definitely open to that. Thank you for asking. I suppose that's also my turn to go to then. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Tanse and uh, Tanse Bruce, uh, Nathan Grandjean, Nitsi Gasson, Nehao um, Nia, Mikasu um, Cree First Nation Nia, oh, yeah. um, Equa uh, Irish, Equa Canadian, Kayate oh, wow. um, Ochinia, um, Vancouver Ochinia. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is uh, Nathan Gr James Grandjean. I come from the larger Cree Nation, uh, also from the Mikasu Cree First Nation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very uh, I don't know, can I still be proud to come from Fort McMurray? But anyways, that's where I'm from. I'm from <laughs> Fort Mac and uh, from the heart of the Peace River Delta and all the rich bounty of wildlife that comes from there and the uh, perhaps less rich oil resources that come from there. Um, very grateful to join this book club today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, very grateful to be welcomed here in this place. And I absolutely love the safety rules uh, that you put in place, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much for those. I, I very much raise my hands to you. Thank you very much. Um, so just recently, actually, I joined the city of Vancouver um, on their economic commission as their senior manager of indigenous economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. And as the city has recently released a report on UNDRIP. They want to implement UNDRIP. And they took the rather, um, I thought, for Canadians, anyways, progressive step of inviting the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples to decide what that meant. What does that mean to these First Nations on whose traditional territory, unceded territory, uh, Vancouver resides on? And so I found the book very... Um, very refreshing because it put a lot of legal contemporary issues across Canada into a relevant focus. It wasn't just a bunch of legalese. It was very much, <laughs> what does this mean now? And I very much appreciated that. So uh, uh, hi, hi. Uh, thank you very much. My C, uh, Bruce, that was, um, it's an excellent book. Uh, it's one I'm going to be referencing and proselytizing to people uh, oh, for years you. to come. Um, so coming from what I've just said in, in regards to a, a bit of my own focus on like economic prosperity, I'm just curious uh, for yourself, um, how do you feel about the implementation of UNDRIP across Canada in regards to economic prosperity? Do you perhaps see this as a path forward, as a hindrance, and what sort of, um, you know, immediate stumbling blocks or opportunities might revolve around that? Yeah, thanks. Nathan, um, uh, I was just up in Fort McMurray a couple of weeks ago. So I lo lovely up there. Um, um, as you can probably tell, those of you that have read the different pieces in my book, uh, um, I don't think I'm cynical about it, but I'm not overly um, optimistic too. 
to go to your point about what the downsides might be, one of the concerns that I have is we don't want to follow fall into a situation that we've seen too many times where non-Indigenous governments say, well, we already passed this untrip legislation, so what are you complaining about, right? Look at all the good things we did, but they're not actually doing anything substantively new, which we've all seen, I think, far too often. And I'm concerned that the undrip legislation could turn into that, both provincially and federally, because as probably a lot of you know, there is provincial legislation in B and then there's federal across the country because both BC and the federal government look at it as being an aspirational um, endeavor so that it's something that's going to change in the future and not making any serious change right now. And I think that's where a lot of, of the tension is because we don't want to be in a situation where um, colonizing governments are saying, hold on, just wait another year, five years, 10 years, we'll, things will get better. Uh, I don't think that will put us into a better place. And then second, does it create a standard that um, in its implementation that um, favors First Nations who are participating in the exploitation of their lands. And what I mean by that is in BC recently, a couple of months ago, there was the first consent-based agreement signed under the UNDRIP legislation with the Taltan in Northwestern BC. And this was really heralded as being an important step forward because it seems to be based on consent. But the problem or one of the challenges with that is that um, are they going to be signing any of those kind of agreements with Indigenous people that would actually likely to be withholding their consent? <laughs> you know, the thing with the tell tan it's about one mine and they've they've been working with the provincial government and with the with the mine proponent for so long i don't think there's much doubt that they will give consent and what about indigenous people that they know will never give consent for certain types of projects that aren't sitting on a gold mine um, are we going to end up in a situation where the response from government is we don't need your consent unless you have one of these types of agreements and by the way you're never going to get one <laughs> we don't want that situation because i think there's good support in the law now without relying on undrip that consent is required we don't need undrip for that most importantly, it's required under Indigenous people's own laws. You don't need colonizer laws for it. And then even in Canadian law, uh, there is good support for the consent requirement. So I hope I don't come across as sounding overly pessimistic. I think I'm being realistic. It's just for a lot of us that have done this work for a long time um we've learned to be pretty skeptical of you know uh um what's what's the right word for it? wolves and sheep and sheep clothing so i just encourage us all to wait and see and hold governments to account as best as possible Th thank you nathan Oh, it was great. Thank you. I uh, have been wanting to talk to you about um, kind of, I just did a whole podcast on Sovereignty Act 
and uh, mm -hmm. you know how ridiculous it was um, yeah. what Daniel Smith was doing. But honestly, the whole concept of a province on top of uh, you know as jurisdiction it is is never was never negotiated with treaty. So like I, I've always just found the whole concept of the provinces and territories ridiculous too, uh, with the exception obviously of what none of it had done, um, you know, and became their own territory and 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 had their own jurisdiction. And for folks who who might not see it, Nathan says, thank you. What a great answer. It's so important to temper any enthusiasm for what little traction we get as Indigenous people when dealing with settler governments. And it, it's so true. I. Uh, so for folks who don't know, a lot of folks who are here that are Calgarians are a big part of our Reconciliation Action Group. And um, so the point is, is to get them to do actual work and they do that work and they write their letters and they uh, write letters on behalf of Reconciliation Action Group and as opposed to it just being Michelle Robinson. Because I think all of the indigenous here know, well, it's just one indigenous voice. And mm -hmm. even like if you have a whole treaty, if you have a whole nation, you have a whole band, it's still not good enough, right? Like the, that racism is so deeply embedded in everything, mm -hmm. right? That anti-indigenous bias. So anyway, the Reconciliation Action Group is mainly composed of actual settlers doing the actual work. And, um, and and Kat, she never mentioned it, but she has a Settlers Book Club, which, of course, I encourage everybody here to go to as well um, as part of that anti-racism work. If you're interested, don't hesitate to reach out. I would never be offended because one, you're reading, <laughs> two, you're learning how to be anti-racist. So go for it. Give her. Like, these are the types of partnerships I want in my life. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I think next I'm just going to pause it for a second here. Great. I guess it's my turn. Um, I am a settler in Prince George, which is the unceded oh. Tlaitla Tene territory. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I am behind and I, I'm not prepared, but I wanted to come and meet you and listen. So thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I was just up there two weeks ago, I think. I was. Uh, I was doing a meeting in Burns Lake. I'd flown into into Smithers with a rental, and it was when we had the uh, um, huge snowfall here in Vancouver, like an inch or two, and the whole city <laughs> was closing down. And they canceled my flight from S Smithers uh, two days before the snow st the snowstorm, or or the day before. So I. Um, I had to drive my rental from Burns Lake down to Prince George and leave it there at the airport to get back again. So, um, but just on that point, I'm really glad that you were mentioning that point, Michelle, about non-Indigenous people, uh, the important work that they can t t do on this, that point that you were making. I. I refer to that as the cruel calculus, because I've seen it so many times with Paul with politicians. Is this an indigenous issue? Oh well, we don't have to be as concerned about that. But is it a non-indigenous one? Whoa, you know. So you can just see it going out to uh, demonstrations. I encourage non-indigenous people to get out. Get out there. Don't be in front. That wouldn't be good. But, you know, be there in the crowd because politicians are watching and they want to see is this an issue that spills over and is is important to non to non indigenous people. Um, I do this work all across the country and I often get in situations where my First Nation clients will be reaching out to local non-Indigenous people. And I end up speaking at a lot of their gatherings and explaining to neighbors, you know, uh, your objectives and values and principles probably align very closely with your First Nation <laughs> friends here. And if you want to achieve those things, you should support them because they have constitutional rights 
you don't. <laughs> you don't. You know, your procedural rights under the provincial or federal environmental assessment act, that won't get you very far. But these people here have constitutional rights. And so it, we're really smart to support them because uh, your values align, not all the time, but a lot of the time. I, one of the experiences in court that always has stuck in my head, I was at the Supreme Court in 2004 for the Haida uh, he hearing and the village of Port Clements on Haida Kauai, a very a small non-Indigenous community, about 90% employed by the forestry company, came to the Supreme Court, intervened, not on behalf of their employer, Mac Blow, but on behalf of the Haida. And I remember the look on the Chief Justice's face at the time. She was basically, what are you doing? <laughs> You're sitting on the wrong side of the aisle. But it was such an eye opener, right? Because they said, we want to protect the forest too. Because if we continue with this clear cutting, their short term jobs, but there won't be any sustainability for our children and our grandchildren. So things have to change about how the forest is managed. So that just one example that really res uh, has re resonated with me for a long, a long time. That's awesome. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you for encouraging our, uh, our settler allies in a good way, because I, I, you know, you can say it until you're blue in the face, but sometimes when it comes from a new voice, it resonates a bit differently, right? Like it sinks in differently. So I appreciate that. Um, sure. Shelly, I think you're up next, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hello, I'm just getting over, getting over stuff. Um, I, I was able to read the whole book. And I kept referring back to the book, The Color of Law, the Stanford or professor from the ACLU, mm -hmm. about how you talked about the Supreme Court would rule something and the government's go, nah, nah, I'm not going to listen. That's what I felt. <laughs> and that's, I know The Color of Law is a book, sorry, I should explain what that book is. It's a book about redlining and racial se segregation in the States. It's it's more law heavy. <laughs> it's very yeah. thick book. It's not a good uh, book club book, but it's a great book. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but it's it was really good. But And I found it, a lot of similarities in Canada because this, of course, was at the States. And what are your thoughts? Do you, did you find the similarities, Bruce, with the that the government, the Supreme Courts would say no, side on the, the the marginalized groups, and then the provinces would go and do it anyways. Like I, and I'm glad that you include um, grassy narrows. Like that was done in the '60s, and they're still only getting the uh, the the um, shovels be in the ground next year. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Shelly, um, that is one of the refrains I hear all across country from my clients is, um, why don't colonizers follow their own laws? <laughs> this is one of the things, one of the reasons I'm not, um, I'm a little more critical of the UNDRIP legislation than some people are, because from my perspective, it's not that there's a shortage of legal obligations. It's not that there's an uncertainty about these obligations. There's a lack of political will to follow them. That's the challenge. So when I see people, well, UNDRIP will change it all. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think we necessarily need more legal obligations. That can be of a assistance but we need the will of government to follow them um, just on the point about that book a more recent one just out this year is a book called anti-indian u.s 
law. And it's it's now it's more of a lawyer's kind of book, but I enjoyed it a lot because it goes more into the detail than I have about the doctrine of dis of discovery and the racism that's at the root of that pr principle and how it developed in the U.S. Um, so I would I would encourage everyone. Uh, we hear so much about the rule of law in Canada and um, holding government officials to account to actually follow the law. I I think that's some of the most important work that we can all be be doing. I, I think you're absolutely right. What Jody Wilson Raybolt said the last the last time, and what she said before, is that politicians got to stop doing the four year thing. Mm -hmm. We're not going to solve any systemic problems with the four year thing. I forgot to say that I'm a settler and I'm also autistic, so I I really am being fair and or like equ equity no equal I always get equity and equality mixed up but mm -hmm. um and I just it just it just because when you fight for it's it's not ableism and anti-indigenous uh, bias is different but it's the same thing it's coming from capitalism and colonialism that we're only good as much as we produce yeah, well, and just the the language, it's a good example, right? Because the whole language about disability all the time, there's a lot of similarities there, how language is used against Indigenous people. One of the things I was thinking about recently, and you'll see in my book, there's this test for Aboriginal title about occupying the land. And I was thinking about that more. That's a good example about how Canadian courts uh, beat little and deny Indigenous people the same access to the law, the same rules of law. Because if you were a non-Indigenous person, the term that you would likely use is be you possess the land. You're in possession of the land, which as probably a lot of you know, is nine tenths right, of the, of the law. So um, instead, indigenous people's interest in the land is referred to as occupation. Occupation of the land, it's something less. It's something that puts them on the outside. They're not part of the normative non-Indigenous relations to the land or the normative. And it's just like the conversation about abled and disabled, right? So if you're, that's the normative. And so there, I think there are, there are a lot of similarities there. And just being aware of those things. I was out at a play, I think, it, yeah, here in Vancouver. I think it was the, on Saturday night, my wife, took me to the sing the sing along version of uh, sound of music <laughs> fortunately i didn't sing much but they did the typical land acknowledgement at the beginning why do we always refer to you know tradition traditional ancestral lands they're just lands like those are indigenous lands. Referring to them as traditional and ancestral puts them in a different category. Somehow it's about the past, you know? No, they're just lands, unceded lands, stolen lands. <laughs> That's what I, it I will is. mention one last thing. And one last thing. People don't realize that they could become temporarily or permanently disabled at any point in their life. And the older they get, the more likely they are to get a disability and people don't get that. And it's like, and we're the largest ma ma marginalized group with 15% of the world, about 1.1 billion people. Yeah, really good point. Sorry, I just had to add that. Yeah. Thank you.
Thanks. It's recorded, so it's for everyone. My my four followers on YouTube will hear it I, if they watch. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no, you know what, Bruce? One of the things that um, I've said to people about Undrip, like Undrip in, as itself is a fabulous document. The problem is, is when Canadian law puts it through Canadian lens and then makes it law, and uh, we've seen that with BC and what's suit to win, right? And and mm-hmm. so. You know, here we have all these wonderful advocates, some right from Alberta here that went to the UN to make this beautiful document just for Canada to totally mess it up at every Mm -hmm. conceivable opportunity. So it's so difficult because I try to advocate for these things just for settlers to take it. And it's interesting. I I want to um, get from my daughter her land acknowledgement because they're teaching that in her school. She's in grade 10 here in Calgary and they're teaching land acknowledgement. So, and I do teachings of land acknowledgement as my D- Indigenous 101. And like you, mm. you kind of see on the spectrum of how people are on their oppression understandings of, of settler colonial dynamics based on how they give their, their stupid land acknowledgement. So like, <laughs> you know, until I hear we're on stolen land, we are colonizers, yeah. you know, but I had a great, a great person in my life from uh, the university and she had, she's a faculty with social work. And she says, right in her signature, she's like, until we implement the child welfare components of the TRC, I am complicit in the ongoing genocide um, of yeah. indigenous people on their unstolen lands. Right. And I'm like, that's the land acknowledgement I want to see <laughs> every Canadian right. do. <laughs> that's right. Well, yeah. That's a really good point. The um, I was asked, I was giving a talk, a webinar for lawyers in Manitoba last year. And in preparation for it, the organizers asked, well, what do you want to do for a land acknowledgement? And I was, well, can, because it was done online. And I said, can you show that Baroness Von Sketch land acknowledgement? I'm sure some of you have seen it. So that's what we did. (laughs) We began with that land acknowledgement. And I could tell a lot of the lawyers from Manitoba, they were pretty uncomfortable. Like (laughs) they didn't expect it. I've, uh, I've got these shirts I got made up it says on the back, uh, if reconciliation's making you feel good, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and that was a good example. I could see all these people not feeling very good. They felt pretty un- uncomfortable about it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones out there for sure is that that sketch because <laughs> it's like, should we go now? And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's probably how it should <laughs> Just work. carry on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so thank you thank you bruce and uh thank you shelly for for your comments i'm just gonna pause it here for a minute and we're back with wendy go ahead thanks michelle and uh thanks bruce for this book and and for your time tonight um i'm a, a settler here in treaty seven and um Many of the the questions I had, you've you've actually addressed, but I will just make some comments on on how what I specifically enjoyed and took away from your book. Um, I I really appreciated how you unravel how many small decisions add up to a greater whole. So I I felt like by going through the examples you did, you and in plain language you made it very accessible to think about what are these decisions looking like? What does it really look like and feel like for people when they, when they have to um, go to court or, or if they're um, pursuing things of consultation, consent, those pieces were really helpful. Um, I, I, the part I was wondering about really was that, um, you know, how do we, um, help people to see talking about um institutional rights and so that was really powerful and meaningful to hear you talk about um and and so i think maybe the there's one particular it's maybe three or four sentences that i keep coming back to um from the book uh the questions and it just that it's very powerful and so maybe i'll just read that (laughs) to finish off my comment here because it's really resonated with me and i think um, I, I can't stop thinking about it. So 
um, it was page 156, uh, and the, and it talks about the voices of the status quo are loud and relentless, uh, which, hiding behind the self-serving rhetoric of the rule of law and the public interest. They call for the removal of Indigenous peoples from their land. Canadians have a choice to make. Will they double down on denial and oppression, or will they embrace mm -hmm. respect for constitutional rights and Indigenous peoples' laws? Our children will judge the choice that we make today. Um, I, I think why that's so powerful for me is I'm only a, a couple years into understanding my own settler history and understanding Indigenous people's history, but I have um, cared about uh, environmental stewardship for most of my life. Um, and so I, I think about that for my children and those statements that you make in that part of the book and in many other parts are just very um, motivating to hear. So would love to hear any more that you have to say in that realm, but I, I just really appreciate the time you took to do this and um, we'll be coming back to that paragraph probably many times over. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate that, Wendy. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting with that stuff because um, when I started writing all those pieces one of the things that i really had at my for at, at the forefront of my mind is this stuff's not that complicated i really don't have a lot of time for lawyers saying oh it's so difficult it's so difficult give me a break you know i think part of it is because i come from a non-professional family myself i was raised back in the bush in manitoba um, I'm, a, I'm from one of nine kids. I'm the seventh one. Uh, I was only the second one to graduate from high school. The only one to ever go to university and get a degree. Uh, but I knew all my family members are so smart. So smart, like not formally educated, but just such smart people. And uh, you can understand this stuff if it's written out clearly. The problem is, isn't with the audience, it's with the people trying to explain it, right? Making it sound more complicated than it needs to be. So when I started writing the book, that was what I was really focused on, was trying to explain it simply uh, and then why it, it's important, right? Because that's that's the biggest thing. And then the thing I got on to after that, and that piece that you read is an example, was, but one of the best ways to explain this is telling personal stories, right? And I got in trouble with my mom a few times because <laughs> she'd read one of those pieces. <laughs> you can't talk about that stuff, right? But uh, making yourself vulnerable and speaking the truth, it's not something that a lot of lawyers do. I know somebody, <laughs> hey, what the hell are you doing? Right? But I want to communicate this stuff. And that's a better way of doing it. And I don't want to communicate it to a bunch of lawyers. That's not the point of it. I want to engage non-lawyers in this conversation. So that was my mo motivation around it, was finding that voice. And um, I think like we all try to do, be honest. Honesty, honesty rules, man. Like sometimes it's hard. And if you're not being honest, question yourself. Why aren't you just, uh, you know, so that piece that I wrote it there, I got a lot of um, people contacting me just about Indigenous ident identity and talking about it from my own experience, right? Remember, I sent that around to a few of my colleagues before I published it, and they were like, wow, you're just kind of laying it all out there. <laughs> I said, yeah, because I want to show how complicated this is. This is a tough issue, right? So, yeah. So uh, that that was definitely what the motivation was. Um, 
and hard to do. I know some of those are hard to read. That one that someone was referring to, you know, uh, it, it's hard to write that stuff. And it's a good example, you know, for a lot of indigenous people doing this reconciliation work can be traumatizing in itself. You just, I'm sure a lot of you know Indigenous people that are re-traumatized by this. I tell people that um, that week leading up to September 30th, oh my Lord, that is such a difficult week for Indigenous people all across the country. I keep forgetting how hard it is. And again, this year I said, okay, Next year, I'm leaving the country. <laughs> Gotta be gone that week. It's just too hard. And I think for non-Indigenous people to be aware of that, how hard it is, just more demands put on Indigenous people to share all the time, you know, share, share, share. Um, and just how important it is to recognize it, right? I'll uh, give you one quick story. I did a lot of, speaking engagements that week. I spoke at a non-profit here in Vancouver. Took a couple of hours, right? And uh, went down there to their off uh, office and uh, they gave me a cold cup of coffee. <laughs> That's true though. Said. You know it, Mich yep. Michelle, right? <laughs> you know what, Bruce? I just changed my website and I changed it so that it's a minimum thousand dollars an hour to even interact with me because yeah. I had so many stories exactly like that. Um, a TD bank, they asked me to come do a land acknowledgement and on my website, I thought I was being fair, reasonable by saying, you know, for 20 minutes, for a hundred bucks, I'll come. Yeah. 40 emails later, and then they negotiated they tried to say, well, we only need you for 10 minutes. Right. Oh, and I was like, that's yes. it. Like, and you know what? I have had such a reduction in emails since I've changed my website <laughs> because of all of these stupid nonprofits trying to misuse my energy. Right. Yep. And, and yep. it's just so discouraging because in one it way, is. you know, you don't want to shut the door, but on the other, Bruce, you have the first people's law you have books fit from the first people's law. You have your book. You tweet all the time. I religiously have all notifications for you. So that, that way I retweet whatever you have to say. Right. And like, like I can't wrap my head around why this reconciliation is so difficult. We have like the seller book club reconciliation action group. Like I, I can't wrap my, I can't put together this any easier for settlers so at a certain yeah. point it's like you they are committed to misunderstanding they are committed yeah. to not doing this right and like mm -hmm. I, I just blocked the leader of the party I ran for because we've had two interactions where he just outright told me your voice doesn't matter to me like just two just outright just outright said it and I have two yeah. like like screenshots of it from one from three years ago and one from like last week <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm done I'm done trying to yeah. interact with these people mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's a really good point. I saw that piece. I got a piece in my book about that, how ignorance itself is a weapon. It is a weapon. Uh, we just, it, yeah, it's, um, I just can't p p believe how much I see of that all the time. I got asked to speak to a um, uh, Manitoba government people right about consultation i was like okay i'll come and speak right um and they said well we don't have money to pay for your t t time right what what do you charge i was like i said i'm not going to charge you my regular rates right but can you make a donation of a thousand dollars to some you know good cause for indigenous people in manitoba Nope. Sorry, we don't have a budget for that. Well, I got screw off. Like, I'm not coming and speaking to you. You can't even do that. It's an in it's an insult. Right.
Yeah, and it, it's it's so disrespectful that it just shows the foundation of their concept of reconciliation is absolutely not reconciliation in any yeah. capacity. So I I feel you there. My I like I and it's unbelievable to me that people will treat you that way too. Um, I should mention that uh, Bruce t- spoke earlier about the link that he sent me. He sent it to me, so I put it in the comments. So you might want to copy and paste it from there. And uh, Nathan just said, uh, "Thank you for your time. My apologies, but I have a pressing appointment to be with my children's bedtime." And I think we all agree yeah. with that. So we understand. And uh, thanks for the incredible energy and interaction on this important material. You know, so grateful when anybody can come, even if it's for a short time, just so that. Uh, you know, everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question or, or discuss. A, and I think this is one of the most important books because of the stupid sovereignty act that came forward <laughs> in Alberta. And, you know, I talk about UNDRIP, I talk about um, sovereignty, I talk about treaties, I talk about it being the base of our relationship. Here you have this book, like, I can't put these dots more together for our settler colonizers. <laughs> <laughs> Holy, Shelly, I see your hand up. You can uh, unmute yourself there. Bruce, I have a question. Um, one of the programs um, for Alberta's government, I just want to know, know your opinion. Um, I think it was Treaty 8 or Siksika Nation, um, can't put in the link but yesterday, is taking, it was called Persons with Developmental Disability. It would support any, per, um, it's basically, adults with disabilities, um, IQs under 80, so they have a developmental disability before the age of 18. And if people are, uh, live, if Indigenous live off reserve, they will get funding. However, if they are on reserve and with their family members and support, they get no funding. Now, Siksika has taken a, um, read it and I can't remember it because my comprehension has taken the court, the government to court. What is your opinion? I know you have, probably haven't heard about it, but is that something common of on and off reserve? Yeah, I don't know. And I don't know the details about that one. So I can't say. Um, it is common beyond reserve, off reserve. This is one of the ways that the federal government divides Indigenous people is the funding formulas on reserve and off reserve. I end up in community meetings a lot and it's really unfortunate to see the lateral violence between indigenous people arguing about on reserve and off reserve. And I think one of the most important things is that's not indigenous people's fault. <laughs> that's, that's what's done by the call, the colonizers, just the categories and then the reserves and the funding. So. Um, that's where that comes from. But um, just on the family side, I will need to cut out to my, uh, I've, uh, I've got um, young children. And so my wife's kindly made supper and I think they're waiting for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bruce. I yeah. Can't tell you uh, how much we appreciate you coming in. I and I know how much you're worth, and I just can't thank you enough. We put your link tree right in our comments here, and I hope everybody religiously follows yeah. you too and has all notifications on their Twitter, so that that way they can amplify your voice <laughs> and what you're doing yeah. too. So thank you, Bruce. Just I um, was it Kathy? Someone had another question um i'll be sure to take it though before i leave it was more of a comment than a question so i'll let you get on to your dinner okay Okay. thanks okay thanks yeah the link tree thing there's um there's a podcast i did with the globe and mail i think on land back so if you're interested in that there's a piece and then I think there's one with the CBC on on the Pope or something. I can't remember what it was. I was laughing about it because growing up in Manitoba or doing um, the rosary with my grandmother, I never thought I'd get calls from the CBC asking me about the about the about the Pope. 
<laughs> this is weird, man. Yeah, so if you enjoy podcasts, there's a couple of more recent pieces there. Thank you. Thank you all for engaging with my book. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks, Mattel, for inviting me on for all the good work you do. Um, that's how we're going to get to a better day for our children. So th Aww. thank you very much. Thank so you. honored to have you, Bruce. We are so Thanks. honored. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and all of that information that he gave us, we'll put in the links when we put out the podcast so that everybody okay. else who's listening can hear and and Great. link all the uh, tree links podcasts that you were on. Because like I'm all about promoting other podcasts that you were on, Thanks. too because all Thanks. of these subjects matter to me just as much as they matter to you and uh, yeah. having your voice, maybe people will hear it differently. They'll listen to it in a good way. You know, who knows? So the more, the, right. the better, that's for sure. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh my goodness. He's so generous. Holy, how lucky were we to have him for as long as we did. Hey, so I, I'm so happy. Is, is Does anybody else want to chime in? Go ahead, Kathy. Missed the unmute button. <laughs> um, when you guys were talking about being tired and, and, um, allies and stuff I, I I just um I've been kind of heavy the last couple of days here my good friend of 42 years who I always thought was um a good indigenous ally I've come to realize that there's a really huge difference between just not hating us and actually being an ally um because I was trying to talk to her about phoning the chief of police of Winnipeg to uh, you know ask them because you know I did that and I'm giving out the number to everybody like phone them and ask them to search the dump for those two women and um, and she was basically telling me like oh you should like basically there's reasons like they have reasons why they're not searching the dump there they dumped some heavy construction clay and and she's like telling me that maybe maybe I don't know how to watch news because I'm saying Calgary isn't covering any of this. Um, and she's like, well, I because you know, she is a news fanatic, right? Um, but she's like, well, maybe you just don't watch the news and, and something. And and then and as it went on, I like she basically told me that um that I shouldn't get angry and and you know, maybe we should change the topic. And I was just like, wow you know like basically you called me an angry indian and ignorant because i can't i don't know how to watch news or how oh she said she said maybe i need to research the the, the topic more because i obviously wasn't watching the news right or something along those lines and i'm just like holy crap like this is somebody i've known since i've been 15 years old so for 42 years and I've realized lately that all she wants is to um, claim allyship. And basically, she loves our art. Her whole house is covered with Inuit art front. She's inherited from her parents. And, um, you know, and I, I gave her my first drum. And I, I feel like asking for it back. Like, I, I wanted to last time. And then after this time, it was like... Before it was just because she wasn't caring for it. And I was worried that she wasn't taking it out to ceremony because I thought she would. Um, but this whole thing has just made me really heavy. And I'm just like totally, totally surprised. Like to just just kind of like, I can't imagine going through this on a wholesale, whole scale, wholesale basis that, that you would do, Michelle. Like, you know, when you're trying to educate large numbers, like. I'm just educating what I thought was a, a friend and I didn't think there'd be any problem getting her to take this phone number and phone the win chief of police of Winnipeg and, and having her white voice um, echo mine, but totally, totally shocked by, by what happened with that conversation. So it's been something that's been on my mind for a couple of days. 
Yeah, I know these moments weigh heavy. Uh, all of you witnessed me going through it with a few folks, uh, a book club regular, um, some folks from the common good. Uh, like you've all witnessed me thinking we were friends, thinking we could repair. And it, at a certain point, you kind of just mourn it and move forward. And it sucks. Uh, Rebecca asks if we can have that number, Kathy. So if you want to throw that in, um, you know, don't hesitate. I know I've seen it going around and I shared it uh, quite a few times and um, hopefully, hopefully it'll get out there uh, to other folks. There it is. So 204-986-6037. And now my understanding is that they have stopped allowing any more dumping um, at this moment. And there, there was actually a local Indigenous group that actually even protested uh, right now. Uh, so I, I'm lucky enough to be a part of a group that we're talking about national actions. And the folks that are on the ground there are just going to sporadically go and protest in the hopes that that dump will finally get looked at and I know that there's asbestos and all the rest of it and I know that's what your friend was alluding to but at the end of the day if this was a white person they would sh search that dump regardless of asbestos or whichever right like they work on it and um and and you know that's that's the insult and uh, you know, when people say you should research that like I I have examples where in Toronto they a white man uh, was looked for by the police in a city dump. Um, the So Josie Nipponak is the uh, executive director for Awuton Healing Lodge. And uh, she's from that area. And her own family member, her own niece, Tanya Nipponak, who we march a sign with every single year for the Sisters in Spirit Vigil, she's in that dump. And they looked for her maybe a week. And one of her aunts had spoken out in, in the news and talked about how much this, how traumatizing this is. I'm not even an English family member, but I've gotten to know many uh, family members of the English family. And I know Joey English is in our dump and I know Calgarians didn't stand up for it. And I know it upsets me just as much knowing that if my daughter's body parts were in there, that nobody would do a damn thing about it. And I can't leave a legacy of letting that happen to my family. No one should be in a city dump and they should change those policies today, now, so that if anybody is murdered and put into the dump and gone through the system, they have a way to track where they could be. That, that is just a policy change. Just like we've forced people to be on reserves, just like we've forced stolen lands, just like we forced Indian residential school, just like we forced starvation, just like we forced oppression and poverty today. These are all policy choices. We can choose to change this policy. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, as far as the dump closure, do you know if that was the, the city, the chief of police, or was that just the protesters that stopped the trucks from coming in? So the national outcry is what made the, the uh, premier and the mayor do a joint conversation and say, we're going to shut it down. But um, the protesters went out there and wouldn't let anybody take, put anything in other parts of the dump either, right? So like um, the, the section they think they might be in, um, they closed. And then the protesters are like, we don't give a shit. Nobody's putting anything in here now until... And uh, so like if I were the, because the Winnipeg police absolutely doubled down on this decision and they doubled down on it at least twice, once against the family and then publicly. And nobody gave them forgiveness, including myself. Um, you know, I, I told them change your policies. And I had, you know, settlers come into my Facebook feed and I was a little more forgiving to this veteran because he's a veteran. Um, whitewashed veteran <laughs> but you know at the end of the day I just said change policies and I just kept doubling down on change policy uh until so Rebecca chimed in thank you very much I have some accessibility issues and preach appreciate very much being given the number so thank you Rebecca for pointing that out I know earlier Rebecca you kindly let us all know that you also have autism um so I am able-bodied uh, and I am working on that privilege. Uh, that said, I, I'm trying to unpack what meaning having long COVID means. Uh, so like Shelly's point, temporarily able-bodied, 
right? Um, go from there. And Shelly, I seen you unmuted. Would you like to speak? Michelle has been like, I've learned so much from Michelle. I mean, I know we've learned, but it's been both ways, but it's been two years now, almost two years since we were spoke on that one panel. And it's just been like, I know I was on, I was on Amnesty. I did volunteer for Amnesty for quite some years, four years. And I think I've learned more now from you and this group. And I feel more welcomed as an autistic person myself. And it just means the, means the world to me. Oh, that's great feedback. And we do want to make it an inclusive space for everyone. And I just tried to tell people, I consider Kent Hare a friend of mine. And, um, you know, my house is not accessible to my so-called friend, right? Um, so for me, understanding how bad accessibility issues are, like just, it starts right there. My own friend can't come here. I have another friend, Dad Peterson. He, um, you know, he goes by wheels on, and he's also a disabilities advocate. He, uh, he can't come to my house, you know, um, we've accommodated uh, him by, you know, like lifting him up and, and moving a wheelchair whenever trying to do door knocks, things like that. But at the end of the day, this world is not made to be accessible for everybody, right? Um, I have neighbors across the street, they have two vans that are wheelchair accessible, because that's uh, one of them lives in a wheelchair. And I like, I see them struggle too. And we're not on great terms. So I don't, you know, obviously, I can't help a lot or, or be very involved, because politically, they are very not aligned with how I feel about things, despite having a wheelchair. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know what the right answers are. But I do know that, um, I, I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate us trying to learn from each other the best way we can, uh, trying to create the safest space we can, um, but also recognizing that this is valuable information that should go out in the world to the four people that listen. I'm just kidding. I am just kidding when I say that. I know more people listen than just four people, but it's just kind of fun. <laughs> Or I think I'm funny anyway. So yeah. All right. Anybody else like to chime in? Or do we want to maybe? Um, oh, I maybe what I will say, if we're going to kind of move forward from this conversation. Um, I, <laughs> of course, I did it last minute. Why wouldn't I do it last minute? Um, I put together a book club. These are books that kind of over the course of the year, I wanted to read. So uh, for the next book, now this, the next two books were at least in the 12 CSI. So we were at least two, two months ahead here. You had two months to know. But the um, next one will be chapters nine and 10 of the National Inquiry on January 9th at 6.30. Um, on February 13th will be City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller. So I was having a look at the uh, National Inquiry and um, I thought we'd just do chapter 11 for March. For April 10th, I found this book, The True Spirit and Original Intent of Treaty 7 by Treaty 7 and Tribal Council. And I thought that was a pretty, pretty important book for us all to read. I'm pretty sure Settlers Book Club has done it, but I wanted to do it because I haven't actually read the book. So I have to make time for it. Um, in May, we'll do the calls to justice in uh, after chapter 11, because that's actually quite a bit of pages. And then in June, I wanted to do Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. I haven't got that book yet, so I got to get them. I'll, I'm going to ask, oh, I guess July will be the last part of the National Inquiry is kind of like testimonials and some resources. So I thought it would give us an opportunity to kind of go through all of that and see what we have. So it's like pages 219 to 349. But a lot of them are references that I think you have to go online and like kind of click through. So whatever you want to talk, discuss from that, I thought it would give us an opportunity and it'll be summer. Um, you know, it'll be uh, just uh, during the stampede. So um, August, Our Voice of Fire by Brandy Morin. And then September 11th, I thought we would do the 113 Pathways to Justice. So that's the provincial look at the national inquiry and then putting it into 113 Pathways to Justice. And then October, uh, Cree lawyer Harold Johnson's book, Peace and Order, Peace and Good Order, sorry, The Case for Indigenous Justice, Making Space for Indigenous Feminism, edited by Joyce Green. And then 
um, on November, a report to guide the implementation of a national action plan on, gen on violence against women and gendered based violence. So that's a PDF, which I gave in the link so that that way we could discuss it. Think by November, what we will have as an example, like you're going through their website about, did they actually do anything? No, I, I read the whole thing. Uh, well, I kind of skimmed through it. And at one point in time, they said, we didn't have time to do any outreach with indigenous women. And I'm like, mm -hmm. there's a shock. And then uh, December, I kept open because I was like, oh, Jody Bilson Rainbow's last book. We haven't done it yet. So I'm like, should we do that one? Or will there be another book that is like we have to do? So anyway, I thought I'd wait to see there. And then I gave the Zoom link um, with all that information. I've posted it on Facebook and Twitter. So I'll try to get the other ones out right away after the book club. And uh, yeah, any questions or um, maybe I, I, I just have always encouraged throughout all these years of book club that if there's a book you absolutely want to read, let me know so that I can add it to the list. And then of course, Kat and her settler book club is out as well. Uh, Kat, did you want to go through any of your book? I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Maybe I should have kind of gave you some heads up on that, but uh, did you want to talk about your book club at all? Sure. Yes, I would love to. Um, I, um, uh, my book club is about uh, three years old. Um, I started it after I sort of started thinking about um, starting a book club. And then I went to Michelle's book club and she was so supportive and lovely and said, yes, do it. So um, I started three years ago as well. Um, I tried uh, I tried to do um, Indigenous authors as well as um, February is Black History Month. So I usually choose a or I do choose a, um, a black author. Um, and I like to, um, or I, I like to address anti-racism too and how um, white supremacy is ruining everything for everybody all the time. So um, in the past, you, if you just go to my website, you can see what, um, what we did in the past, but coming up uh, next year, um, January, uh, I, I choose Inuit novels. So the first one is Sanak, an Inuit novel. And I'm not going to say the author's name because I don't want to um, ruin it. <laughs> uh, February is Shame on Me, an Anatomy of Race and Belonging by Tessa McWatt. Uh, March is Stars and Scar Scars and Stars by Jesse Thistle. Uh, April is Demystifying Disability by Emmy Ladau. Um, and that is co-hosted by our lovely disability activist, Shelley Nearing has, um, and I'm really grateful that she's agreed to, to um, co-host with me. Um, May is Laughing with the Trickster on Sex, Death and Accordions by Thompson Highway. That was his Massey lecture, and that is available um, on my website, the link to the lecture, so you can uh, listen to it if you didn't want to read or listen as well as read. Uh, June is Making Love with the Land by Joshua Whitehead. July is Living in Indigenous Sovereignty by Elizabeth Carlson Manathara with Gladys Rowe. I think that one's going to be really cool because it's um, talking about um, Indigenous relations with settler folk and settler folk who are actually, you know, doing some stuff that they should be doing, like... Um, activism type stuff. Um, August is A Two-Spirit Journey, the autobiography of a lesbian Ojibwe Cree elder by Mani Chakabi. September is Deep Diversity, a compassionate scientific approach to achieving racial justice by Shaquille Choudhury. Choudhury sorry. Um, October is Roses Run by Dawn Dumont. Um, I really felt um, necessary to support Dawn in, in some sort of small way because what she's been going through this last year. Um, and November is Moccasin Square Garden short stories by Richard Van Camp because we haven't read any Richard Van Camp yet. So I tried to make it to 50%. Um, I usually have female authors, but I've introduced a few more male authors. Um, a lot of the male authors are queer um, writers as well. So it's uh, is a little bit more intersectional too. 
So that's my, that's my book list. And I'm quite excited about it, even though I usually only get three people show up. <laughs> Rosemary and Shelly being two of them and Kathy being the third. So <laughs> we're a good solid little group, but you're all welcome to come and join us too, if you don't have enough to read. <laughs> You know what, Kat, I, you're just motivating me to add to, um, like comment on any of my stuff to also, uh, add yours because like, uh, I had a, a fellow or a friend post something to the effect that I can't make any of those dates. Right. Because I'm really set on every second Monday. So maybe they can make yours or, you know, um, and, and they said, well, thanks for the book list at least. And I, I love your book list. Like I wish I could do all of the books, but I know I can't. And I'm, I'm actually trying to put more effort towards that so that I can not just read my books, but read yours too. And then that way uh, participate in both because uh, so first of all, Afro uh, indigenous people feel like on Twitter, they are point blank, honest, like you guys erase us. So, you know, like there's a, a real uh, lack of understanding of how many black indigenous people there actually are. So I love that you include that. And I also love um, that you include accessibility lens and do that anti-racism work. TRC uh, 57 is anti-racism work and indigenous education. So to me, it's incredibly important that you're doing that work. And I, I just think so highly of Dawn as well. I'm really glad that you're doing that book for that reason alone. And I, I wish I could, I wish I could do a book a week at least. Yeah, like do. that would be my goal for sure. <laughs> because I, there's so many great indigenous artists and or authors. And then, you know, and then like you, we all know there's a great, you know, YouTube of them talking or whichever. Right. And, and maybe one day it'll be on my YouTube that, you know, I'll get five people who read it watch it and watch our artists. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and, you know, one of our, our participants said, I got to run to another meeting, sending y'all supportive vibes, Rebecca, I have to go to another meeting. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, if you want to stick around, oops, I just hit my mic. If you want to stick around, you're welcome to, if you got to go, thank you for coming. Uh, always appreciate it. And uh, Jen, you've been really quiet. What did you think of your first book club? It was so good. Thank you. Um, I, I had technical issues here. My computer was dying. So I was fiddling around trying to get it plugged back in. But yeah, no, this was awesome. It was such a treat to have the author present. Um, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, and, and lots of different perspectives. So thank you all. Oh, grateful you came. And I hope you can make, uh, you know, mine or, or, or cats anytime. And you're welcome at the Reconciliation Action Group as well. Uh, Rosemary, she's done anti-racism work in the city for years, decades. So, you know, if, if we can incorporate you into our world, we will. Uh, Wendy, thank you so much for your, your kind words there and for joining us today. We appreciate it. All the kids need to go to bed, don't they? Holy, yeah, I know it's tough. And I think that's the benefit of now not being at the Calgary Public Library. You know, it, it's not just COVID. It's not just flu season. It's just accessibility. Why drive? Like, I think of Rosemary who has to drive like 45 minutes. And how many of you have to drive 45 minutes to come to the Calgary Public Library in Forest Lawn and then drive that way back? You know, it just makes more sense. Transit. <laughs> right? Or transit. <laughs> And, you know, um, so, so I just, I, I hope you all uh, understand. And then having folks from other parts of, of the country and another country come join us. Like for me, I'm really glad that it's worked out this way and that a lot of you have been able to participate in this way. So I just want to say thank you. I want to say happy holidays to all of you, no matter how you celebrate your, your holidays. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to unpack what Christmas means to me, but I'm wearing my ugly Christmas sweater because we all need ugly Christmas sweaters. <laughs> Our generation is taking them. We, we went by, uh, I think it was Northern Reflections. And I said, Sam, that's the OG of the ugly Christmas sweater, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> having those fun conversations of what does Christmas mean to us after you know, as, as part of our reconciliation journey. So uh, I, I don't necessarily want to say Merry Christmas. Um, and to piss off any Republican that might be listening, you're welcome. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
Yeah. If anybody has any lasting thoughts, you're more than welcome to hop on. And uh, if you have to go, thank you for coming. <laughs>